desire to do all this research and get this information out is surely motivated by the fact that I don't want to see my brothers and sisters who are living in darkness one more day in that darkness. <laughs> Hey, this is Unrefined Podcast. I'm Brandon Spain, your host, with co-host Lindsay Waters. Welcome to another episode. Hey, 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 everybody. We have a new show, and I'm here with Lindsay. Hey, guys. And a very special guest, Vicki Joy Anderson, author of... They only come out at night. Lindsay has my copy of it, so. Say, I'm looking at. Yep, they only come out at night. It's about about sleep paralysis. So, <laughs> so but but today we're going to do something different with this. I kind of ask her ahead of time. You know, if if any podcaster or interviewer was to ask you, what do you want to talk about, or that, or or something that they very rarely ask you to talk about, I guess is a better way to put it. Uh, what would that be? And and she gave us a topic, and we're going to let her explore this topic. And it's I, honestly it's something that I'm new to, and I am excited to learn from her about all this stuff. Which uh, I, I want to say this a caveat. By the way, Kenny says hello. He wanted me to tell you that he was on our podcast last night, oh, doing the movie Hi, thing. Kenny. So, yeah, awesome. <laughs> yep. So he, he wanted me to give you a shout My out from another mother. Yep. <laughs> And so Sweet. Shout out, shout out back at you, Kenny. Yeah. So anyway, Vicki, will you pray for us before we start and then we just get to dive in? Okay. Absolutely. Uh, Father in heaven, we just pray for this time and I just pray that you would set a guard over my mouth and keep watch over the door of my lips. I pray that everything that I say would be pleasing to you. It would bring glory to your name, that it would be true, that it would aid and abet in people's bringing you glory in the exposing of the deeds of the devil. And most importantly, that it would set captives free. If there's anyone out there in bondage to the deception of the things that we are about to talk about. Father, if anything I say is useless or silly or stupid, I pray that it would just get edited out or it would just slip through the mind of the, of the listeners and I just pray, Father, ultimately for the glory of your name and the setting free of captives and the exposing of the deeds of the devil. And we just pray all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Yeah. Awesome. So, Council of Eight. <laughs> we, Lizzie and I both did a little research. There we go. But, there we go. Drum roll. Yeah. Brrr, it, it, but it was like very, it was, <laughs> it, it was like, it's, it's almost like it's hidden. It's like you can't really do much research on it. I, I don't know if that's a intentional thing or, you know, we found um, it was the lady's name that we it, that you did the interview with on her podcast. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a few, um, but I'm, I think you're talking about Michelle Carpenter. Yeah, yeah that's, that's one Michelle. Of the people. Yeah, yeah. Um, we watched we watched that, and yeah, it was interesting yeah. on, on on your sleep paralysis book, and then. Uh, uh, I watched one of some of her videos and one of the videos I watched was, was, was her channeling too, which I just wanted to kind of get a taste of what was going on and stuff and, and everything. So, but we couldn't find much at all. So we're totally relying on your, you know, what you, your research and what you found <laughs> out about them. So if you, if you would just, just start and explain to us what it is basically, and just, just dive in. Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to preface this. With, I really want the audience to understand why this topic is near and dear to my heart. You know, mm -hmm. there's those purists that say that Christians, we should be, you know, keep the main thing, the main thing. Let's preach the gospel and let's preach Christ crucified and anything else is superfluous and it's unnecessary. And let's not titillate people with all this arcane stuff. There's no need to know that. And the reason why I think it's important to, as the spirit leads, delve into some of these more arcane topics is because. There are any number of thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not millions of people on planet Earth who right now, today, do not claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. 
but one day they will be. And they will be because seeds have been planted. And there are people existing on planet Earth right now who will rule and reign with us as our brothers and sisters in Christ for eternity. But they're not there now. And Mm. they're still our family. And there's people that are being caught up into this doctrine. And they are, are being deceived. And I love these people because they're going to be my brothers and sisters forever. And so I am that my desire to do all this research and get this information out is purely motivated by the fact that I don't want to see uh, my brothers and sisters who are living in darkness one more day in that darkness. Like, let's Mm -hmm. let's get the truth out and let's hope that the spirit rides upon that truth and convicts and grips the hearers of anyone who might be uh, wrapped up in this doctrine. I would love to be able to provide a biblical explanation. I would like to unmask this council of eight so that you can understand who you're channeling and who you're communicating with, and that you can understand that a better spiritual being to be speaking with would be Jesus Christ, who loves you and who died for you and does not have ill intentions or narcissistic deceptions in mind when he communicates with you. So Mm -hmm. just wanted to give that as a little background as to why I'm doing this. You know, these fringy um, topics are so in vogue now, and they are fun to talk about. And there's just a fine line between uh, talking about these things so that we can preach the gospel and talking about these things because they're titillating. And so I just wanted to make that clear from the get-go, that there's nothing titillating to me about this at all. Yeah, that's that's really interesting you say that. I, I wanted to point out two things. In my devotional this morning, I learned about the word redeem, and I never realized, I've read it a million times in the Bible, redeem, you only redeem something that, that was once owned. So God owned these people, and he is redeeming these people. So you're right. That these people are infinitely valuable, and they're going to become our brothers and sisters one day when they accept Christ. That's, I mean, I love that. And the other thing I wanted to point out is, what I appreciate about what you're saying is, is there's two other guys that I really, uh, I've, I, I have a respect for that do similar. One of them is, uh, I, I'm going to butcher his last name is Carl Technorib, I think, or, um, Oh he, t- uh, yeah. Carl T. Crib. I love him. Yeah. Yeah. He goes to burning man. He goes to these things. He, he is, he is seeking and saving the laws, but, but by going into these things and becoming incarnational in these things. And then the other guy is Nathan Ziebler with what he does with MUFON and stuff. And, and yeah. even what, he- what Heiser used to do with that, the UFO things he did. If we don't go to the fringe, nobody yeah. will. Marzulli. Yeah. And if, if we don't go to the fringe, nobody yep. will. And, and anyway, so I just wanted to share that. I, I, that's what I admire about what I see in what you're doing. So yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. I'm a word nerd. And when you said uh, going to the fringe, w- that's the whole Great Commission is going to the ends of the earth. Going Absolutely. To the and so yep. uh, that means that the people on the fringe, the people on the fringe are, <laughs> you know, are are hearing what's on the fringe. And so I also really like that you brought up um, the word redeem, because what we're talking about here is spiritual warfare. There's There's a war between these souls. And Ephesians 6.12, you know, the whole armor of God, uh, that that verse is quoted and preached about correctly, that, you know, mm-hmm. we armor up because these archons and fallen ones and rulers of darkness are, are, are battling against us. And But what a lot of people don't understand is that's the anti-redemption campaign. Uh, what, what that verse is really explaining is that the enemy is doing the exact same thing that Jesus mm-hmm. is doing. Jesus is attempting to gather his people. These are the people I died for, and I'm I'm gathering them back to myself. But that's what Ephesians six twelve is too. Hey, we were we owned the kingdom of the nations, and the nations are being stolen from us. They're 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 going over to this other kingdom, and so Ephesians six twelve is really explaining the 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 enemy's attempt to regather and redeem. The people that belong to him, the nations who are mm. are praying to receive Jesus, and so uh, I think it's really fascinating uh, to get a picture in Ephesians six twelve of it's that's their 
that's their great commission. That's them attempting to get their people back that are defecting to the other side. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. Yep. I think we forget that we're in a war sometimes. You know, a lot of Christians do it. It, it becomes it, all about yeah. me, me-centered gospel, you know, instead of a, you know, a self-giving love gospel. Hey, my unrefined friends. I just want to tell you guys that I am so thankful that you are my life. Some of our best fans uh, have been writing to us, and, and I, I just so encouraged about how lives are being transformed and people are getting something out of this podcast. I mean, that's what it's all about. That's why we're doing this, is to glorify Jesus and to just look at the world and have a, a more open view of the seen and the unseen and the supernatural in the world. So while we're doing that, we're going to handle all different kinds of topics. But see, what I'd like for you to be involved in or part of is our members only group things that are coming in our members only group that are going to just blow your mind not to mention there's going to be episodes in there that you won't be able to hear just on the normal episode channel so make sure to visit our website at unrefinedpodcast.com and check out our members only community i just can't stress the fact that you know we're after building a community and there's there's so much out there you guys and there's so much coming i really believe we need to build these strong communities of christ followers to to be able to handle what might be coming in the in the future days we're sure that you'd be a good fit and we cannot wait i can't wait to see you there It is difficult to love fringy people. I mean, I was a fringy pe- people, <laughs> and it's difficult to love us because we're <laughs> we're kind of porky piney. But at the same time, once you get us into Jesus, we're going to burn, and and you know sometimes burn out, which is not good. But we're going to burn for Jesus, and because I, I I'm of the type, you know, where when I was before I was saved, I mean, I, I wouldn't sign up for anything unless I could do it all the way. And, and that's how a lot of the, I think the fringy people are is, is they're looking and they're, they're, they're thirsting hard for the answer and we have it. And, and I think that's the, the cool thing about a lot of the stuff that we talk about, like what you're about to talk about and, and other people is, is it does kind of titillate and it draws them in, but then we get to share the gospel, you know, with them by that, that drawing in of what we're talking about. So, Yeah. Absolutely. That, you know, that's the wonderful thing about the New Age and the occult. Everything they do is a mimic or a mime or a mockery or a bastardization of the biblical model. So in, in unraveling what, what these things are, you can always seamlessly preach the, the gospel because that is the mere image of what they're, of what they're doing. And that's certainly the case with the topic today with the Council of Eight. They are mimicking something biblical here. Hmm. And I'm really happy that you brought up the whole man-centered gospel, because one of the reasons why so many New Agers and occultists are sucked in is because it is a man-centered gospel that they're getting. You are wonderful. You are a chosen one. You are a bright being of light. The world needs you. Who doesn't want to hear that kind yeah. of stuff? You know, mm-hmm. where you go to the Bible and it's like, you know, no one is righteous, no, not one, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And it talks about killing your sin and sanctification. And yeah, I, I'd rather uh, have someone kiss my butt too, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, they understand how to lure in a human being. And, and it is through flattery. And a lot of people do all for it. Even, even the Christian church is kind of going this vein too. You know, we talk all about the love and the grace and nobody really wants to take a hard look in the mirror anymore. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Obedience is important and it's, it's all but forgotten in the church today. You know, it's, it's primary. Yeah. We have a lot of head knowledge and we have a lot of, you know, and yeah. And very little, even even in that, I see a Gnosticism of, of a man-centered gospel with people who have right doctrine a lot of times, and yet they have their life doesn't issue forth in any fruit. So that's yeah. that's yes. the other side yeah. that's been infected too. 
Yeah. Yep. Most definitely. Yep. Uh, Vicky. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, oh, no, no, please go. I was going to say when, when I was looking into this, that term ascended master came up a lot. Could you kind of unpack yes. that term for us as you understand it? Yes. Yep, I absolutely can. So that term kind of came into the public uh, awareness in 1934 by an author named Guy Ballard. So that's kind of where it entered into kind of modernity. There, Obviously, these things existed before then, and they probably went by different names. Mm -hmm. But uh, Guy Ballard wrote a book, and it was something like uh, Unveiled Mysteries or something to that effect. But he accredited the authorship of his book um saying that it was dictated to him by an ascended master named saint germain so mm. that is where the whole phraseology ascended masters came into the public vernacular uh, there are other famous authors mostly occult obviously who unabashedly credited all of their writing to ascended masters dictating it to them. Helena Blavatsky being the big one. Mm -hmm. uh, Edith Nesbitt, not a lot of people have heard of Edith Nesbitt, mm -hmm. but Edith Never Nesbitt, she was born like in like, ah, like 1854 or something like that. She, she lived until um, the early, like 1924 or something like that. So somewhere in between 1854 and 1924, uh, Edith Nesbitt was a author and poet. She was from England and she wrote a bevy of children's books, and she unabashedly talked about automatic writing, where um, she would just, like her hand would just be, you know, taken over, and she would write thousands and thousands of words just in one sitting, and like it, this automatic writing that was assisted to her by these ascended masters. And interestingly, and controversially, uh, C.S. Lewis says that Edith Nesbitt was his number one influence for desiring to write children's fiction. So a well, little odd there that um, yeah. that was his influence. But so anyway, uh, what an ascended master is like if you go to Gaia.com or something like that and you look for the, the general definition of what is an ascended master, mm -hmm. what they're what they're basically described as. And you're going to see a lot of Eastern influence here in, in this understanding. It is a astral guru. Um, um, they, they reside in the astral realm. And if you astral project and, and, or meditate or, or find, you know, channel them or communicate with them, they are these astral gurus that are something more than human. But, and here's the interesting part. They were formerly human. So it's putting forth this idea, uh, and this ties all into theosis and Christ consciousness and ascension doctrine. Depending on what era you're from, it's pretty much all the same thing with a mm -hmm. different name. It, it's this idea that we as human beings can ascend to godhood. So we're going all the way back to the garden, very first deception that we, we ever encounter in, with mankind is this, this lie that has yet to ever be fulfilled to anyone it was promised to. You can be as a God. And so, uh, the ascended masters are basically there saying, uh, you can be just like us, uh, if you do X, Y, and Z. And, uh, you know, I don't know that everyone's goal is necessarily to be an ascended master, but a lot of people are believing this lie that they can become as a God. And I don't know what, what the people that are allured by that promise think that is in their mind. I think with our current dumbed down culture, a lot of people probably think that means living in some sort of virtual reality metaverse dressed up like Captain America. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I'm, and I'm not even being facetious. I'm talking about reality shifters and people that just prefer their fantasy world. And in their fantasy world, they will be Harry Potter or Wonder Woman or whatever they deem to be the sexiest. Right. Uh, but the, the only way they're going to be able to very temporarily keep that promise is probably through singularity, through transhumanism, which, you know, yeah. um, if, if that, if, if God like means we, we, we live a little bit longer, 
Um, the, the scary thing about being as the gods, and one of you mentioned Michael Heiser earlier, uh, who was a strong proponent of clarifying the meaning behind Psalm 82. And what th- this is the cleverness of the enemy, the deception of the enemy. Here's where his lie is sort of true. He says that one day you'll become as the gods. Unfortunately, according to Psalm 82, the future for the gods is that they're going to die like men. Mm. So if we know that the ultimate future of the gods is that they're going to die like men under the judgment scepter of Almighty God, then why would we want to be one of them? Yeah. That would be our fate as well. So they're actually offering us something that they will, they will keep that promise. We will become like them, but those that become like them and receive their eternal life before there's a resurrection or before there's a judgment will spend eternity in that form. And when, when you're given eternal life before you're given an incorruptible body and you're thrown into the lake of fire, you're in an eternal body which is why in revelation it says that uh those whose the smoke of their torment rises forevermore mm-hmm. if you actually read that verse carefully it's talking specifically about satan mm-hmm. his minions the fallen angels and all those who took the mark and um worship the image of the beast because the people that took the mark and worshiped the image of the beast received the promise of godhood they received their eternal life too soon and they're now in an incorruptible body. So when they're thrown into the lake of fire, it cannot be destroyed. So that that's the promise of eternal life that, that, that they're getting. Mm-hmm. Vicki, can, can I ask uh-huh. you a, a question? Yeah. And this kind of goes back to something you were saying earlier. What do you think about the Christian doctrine of theosis that comes from like Athanasius and some of the early church fathers? Is is that the same thing that you're talking about? Is that a deception or or... Or is it nuanced? It's a little different. And I, I think it's nuanced. So theosis, um, uh, C.S. Lewis wrote about this as well. C.S. Lewis and those, the proponents of theosis, they aren't saying that you become God. Right. Mm-hmm. But unfor- unfortunately, the doctrine is, it hangs upon such a precise requirement of language that it can be easily misconstrued, mm. misinterpreted, and abused. And it uses phrase the phrase divine spark. And if you are sitting down with another believer and you you are both in full agreement that the, the, the word of God is, is the inspired word and right. you are on the same page and you understand what you're talking about, yes, um I can see I can see what they're talking about, but The word divine spark, like many biblical words, has been hijacked by the enemy. Yeah. And when you talk, when you start talking about divine, the divine spark, and you're getting deep now into Kabbalah, um, just watch the Transformer movie, the first one, all that stuff about the spark and the cube. It's it's all there. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is the, that is the, uh, uh, bastardized version of theosis. It's the Kabbalistic okay. interpretation of it. So it's not that theosis can't be theologically correct, but it requires such precise understanding of the word in the person that's communicating it and the, the, the ears of those that it's being communicated to that it's almost not worth I, it. I think because those terms, it's almost not worth it. I think that an, an, if we want to keep going forward with a theosis idea, let's find it in scripture and let's explain it biblically because yeah. uh, the New Agers and the Kabbalists have, have made mincemeat out of that original mm. doctrine. Yeah. What about yeah. the verse, uh, it's either first or second Peter, about being partakers of the divine nature? How does that play into it? Mm. Right. So being a partaker of something and possessing something is two totally different mm-hmm. things. So mm-hmm. um, if, if my neighbor drives home in, in a Porsche and he's got the title to that car and he parks it in his garage, he is the possessor and the owner of that Porsche. Mm-hmm. If one day he hands me the keys and he lets me drive it one time, 
hey man, that's awesome. And I'm going to hit that pedal as hard as I can and have some fun. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I have to give the keys back and my name isn't on the deed. I, I partook in that for a moment. And I, I only partook in a portion of that pleasure. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the pleasure of owning it. I had the pleasure of getting to tell people, I experienced this. I've got to tell you this. This is awesome. So uh, being partakers in something mm. that doesn't ultimately belong to us is different than we now encompass that. Mm -hmm. If that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. No, that's a great explanation. Well, it's, a, it's the difference between um, participation and ontology. Okay. Ontology being that we become God versus partaker or we're a participant with God. Right. Is that what you're saying? basically yes mm -hmm. absolutely okay absolutely beautiful yeah. sorry sorry guys out in the audience for those big words yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man you got a word nerd here i, I, I apologize I, well, I, so it, yep. go ahead it, if i can steer us to if i can steer us to the council of eight yes this is uh this is something that maybe not a lot of people, maybe you've heard of it. First, first and foremost, this is not to be confused with the Galactic Federation that everybody's talking about. That's kind of like, you know, the, the Star Wars cosmic UN sort of, you know, you got the table with all the different aliens sitting around, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with their flags sitting in front of them and their glass of water. So, no. Um, so the Council of Eight, um, the sort of, um, GaiaDictionary.com sort of definition, I would assume. So the, the Council of Eight is a group of entities uh, with high spiritual frequencies that work together, and their goal is to find souls throughout the universe, so human souls, right? They're, they're, they're a recruitment program, right? They're recruiters. They're cosmic recruiters. They're looking for particular souls, and they then tell these souls that you've lost your memory. You don't remember your true origins. And we're going to explain to you who you really are. You, you've got an identity crisis. You think you're one of these deplorable, filthy human beings. Uh, but no, you, you have to find your true self. And we're going to help you find the true self. And true self, capital T, capital S, right? And yeah. so the, this council of eight is this, uh, recruitment program where they are assisting human beings in their awakening. So mm -hmm. it's all ascension doctrine. And what's, what's sad and scary about this is they are taking a biblical concept, but they're, they're stripping and replacing key characters. So in other words, it'd be like, I can tell a child who's never heard the story of Cinderella. Let me, I'm going to tell the child Cinderella, but I'm going to take out the name Cinderella and I'm going to use the name Vicki Joy. And I'm going to let that child uh, from a young age think that this, you know, rags to riches story of this woman with the glass slipper who married a prince was me. And so that child now doesn't know anything about Cinderella. Um, mm -hmm. And the wonderful princess who lived happily ever after is Vicki Joy. And that's what the council of eight is doing. They yeah. are taking Jesus out of the story and they're saying, it's us, it's you. And so they're, they're just doing a manipulation of the characters, but they're, they're actually basing like they do with everything. The only thing that they can do is manipulate what's already there. So these souls, these souls that they're recruiting they call themselves the star seeds. I don't know if you guys have heard about the star seeds and there's probably a bunch of other names for it too, but star seeds is kind of like the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the top of the line model on the showroom floor, right? Everyone wants to call themselves a star. Yeah. Seed. I heard, I heard Mich Michelle talk about it in her video. I think when in Michelle. Michelle. Okay. Yeah. 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 Michelle. So this might sound silly and, Yet it's no sillier than what Christians can call themselves. In in scripture, we're told that we're strangers. We're told we're not of this earth. We're told that we're pilgrims. In some translations, we're aliens. So we're in essence saying the same thing. The star seeds are saying, I'm not ultimately of this earthly kingdom. And Christians are saying, hey man, neither are we. So we're saying the same thing. Uh, the difference is who is the king of your kingdom? 
what mm. what army are you following? Like, what banner are you following? That's the only difference. So, you know, it's always easy to point fingers at people on the fringe, like we were saying earlier, and roll your eyes and laugh at how silly they sound. But mm -hmm. if you really break down a lot of what, what's in the Bible, we sound pretty silly, too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, we do. This, the star seeds. Well, let, let me go back to the Council of Eight. This is a, this is another interesting thing. Five of the council through the um, going back to 1983. That was when the first Council of Eight made themselves known. Right. And over the course of like from 1983 to like 2007, I think um, five of these eight uh, recruiters on the Council of Eight made themselves known. And, you know, through channeling, they, they, they gave their name and their purpose and what they were doing. Three of these have remained nameless. Now that's interesting. You've got three without a name. Mm. It's almost like there's a trinity residing over these five, uh, but we'll get into the number crunching later. Uh, these, these, um, this council of eight is, uh, interestingly, the five that have made themselves known. They communicate with mankind verbally, audibly, through automatic writing, uh, through more human means of communication. The, the three that remain nameless communicate with mankind energetically. So they're not the ones that are, um, speaking to people, um, directly or, or hooking up with people in the astral or through meditations and things like that. So with that said, uh, I don't want to jump ahead to, oh, actually, I do want to explain this. I am going to read a quote here. The fifth member of the Council of Eight who made themselves known to mankind. And just listen how flattering this is. Listen, j just, I want you to juxtapose what I'm about to read with a scene in your mind of the serpent talking to Eve. Okay. okay. See okay. if there's any similarities in this approach. So the, the last, uh, council, uh, member, and I, there's names for all these guys and I'm not going to give them the time of day. I'm not going to give them, you know, the spotlight. I also think there is a lot of power in frequency and the spoken word. Uh, mm -hmm. let there be light. And there was light, uh, Lazarus come forth and the dead was raised. If you say to a mountain, move, it will move. So we know if anywhere from one to five words, uh, you can actually, um, cosmically realign things just by speaking things out loud. So I'm not mm -hmm. going to give these names the light of day. You go look them up if you're interested. But the, the fifth member of the Council of Eight to make himself known said this. Um, th this was his first instructions to a group of Texas. So I, I don't know. I guess he held a conference or something. I don't know. But this is a quote supposedly, allegedly from this guy. This, this council member, this recruiter. This is the moment in your life when it was promised before you were born that you would be awakened, that you would be told you are not the you that you see in the mirror. That is your disguise. And it is necessary that you came to planet Earth with the disguise. It is necessary that you learned how to fit in and that you pretended to become human but you are not. You are incredibly powerful rays of intelligence, beautiful white spiritual beings, bright light of all that is residing in a physical form, bright ones. I say to the mind and I say to the heart, I say to the soul and the spirit of your being from this point forward, when you look at yourself in the mirror, look only at your eyes and look for the light that is in your eyes. See yourself. Remember yourself. Hmm. Sounds real beautiful, very slippery of tongue, very much like the garden. Very much. I mean, that's yes. how he, very smooth tongue. That's how he convinced Eve and then Adam, you know, is that sounds awesome. I mean, who wouldn't want to be that if you didn't know what it, where it was coming from? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, and it plays on, I, it, it is fascinating to me. These, spiritual beings know more about the human psychology of human nature and our minds and what motivates us and drives us. 
I think every human being on earth, even Christians, even those of, uh, who are following the Lord and pretty much stay out of trouble and have a good life, we all have those moments where we're like, is this all there is? Is this what it's all about? Or why didn't my life go the way I wanted to? How come I don't fit in? How come no one understands me? How come every group, church group I go to, no one talks to me? Uh, we all have these collectively as human beings. We have doubts and we have fears and we have a drive to to be a part of something big and uh, and to leave a mark on 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 the world. And so if someone comes to us and says, here's the explanation, all those doubts that you always had, and you're like, now it makes sense. It's because I'm not really human. I was something, you, you can just see how, um, I, I call this like anti Occam's razor, right? Like the most mm -hmm. logical answer. Um, and in this case, it's like the most fantastic answer. Now in this day and age, uh, the most fantastical explanation is is what's going on and I'll, I'll just give you a funny little analogy i had a co-worker years and years and years ago who knew i was a christian and so she came to me and she's like vicky my house is haunted and she started explaining all this paranormal activity that was waking her up and i said dude i said i i hate to be so anticlimactic but it sounds like you got a mouse in the wall and she's like no no she was so disappointed she wanted this christian to tell mm -hmm. her you know about all the evil spirits in her house and how she needed an exorcism and all this stuff and so she walked away pretty disgusted with me. And I, I will give her props for having the humility to admit this to me. But she came to me a couple of weeks later and said she found all the mouse poop in the drawer, her, her dresser drawer. So, so, uh, <laughs> uh, but all that to say, you know, I, I've even noticed this with the people who I've talked to with the sleep paralysis. You know, sleep paralysis does not need to be enhanced. It does not need to be dressed up. It's terrifying. It's scary. It's, it, you know, it, there's demonic elements to it. And it, you don't have to do anything more to dress it up to, like, convince people it was scary. But, you know, then you've got the people that are kind of seeking to find everything in their life then that's related to that. And like, well, you know, the other day. My, my light bulb flickered a few times and then it, the, the light bulb burst in it. It's like, you know, not every busted light bulb is a demon. And so I, <laughs> I think that the, this is extremely, when you look at the mental health of 21st century America and you look at how bereft we are of biblical truth, we are ripe to receive this kind of information. Mm -hmm. You are a bright one. And, and even that's based on a biblical truth. Someday we are going to shine bright like the stars of heaven, but not because we became like a God. It, right. It's because we're going to be, we're going, it, it, so it, it, it's, it's, a. It, they're doing the same thing that the serpent did in the garden. He's just weaving a faint, lie through a whole bunch of, of truth and what this is basically uh this this council of eight is it's basically preaching pre-existence um but you were um in some angelic form if if you read the pistis sophia which is a, a greek the, the book of wisdom right mm -hmm. it it teaches in the pistis sophia uh pre pre-existence mm -hmm. and it's not just the simple you were a soul, like, you know, there's a warehouse in heaven and he just pulls a soul and like, you know, softball throws it into a womb, right? It's far more complicated than that. It's, let, let me give you the orthodox Kabbalah explanation of it. Their explanation is that when the third of the angels fell, there were angels that took Satan's side and there were angels that took God's side, but there was this mysterious Switzerland mamby-pamby group that couldn't decide. Okay. Really? Mm -hmm. So the mamby, yeah. So the mamby pambies that couldn't make up their mind, who, which one was greater, they got put in a heavenly detention center and their punishment and, or their opportunity uh, to make things right was, that they were going to be given the opportunity to be put in a human body and 
live out a human life and through the course of living a human life in a human body, learning all of the lessons and having all the experiences, they would then, at, upon their death, they would have then made their choice like, like we do, whether they choose to be a sheep or a goat. And so in addition to this not being biblical, again, we have this seed of flattery that the Bible says that we are forefathers, you know, ancestors of our forefather, Adam, and that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But even in this doctrine, the pre-existence doctrine, it's like you were this angel that stood before the throne of God and witnessed the war in heaven. And, and you've forgotten that peace, but that peace can be brought back to you. And then you'll come into your true identity. And so it, it's all very cosmic and, and flattering. And, you know, what person who sat in a dry church their whole life and not heard anything but how wicked and awful they are, would like to hear the reason why you're having so much struggle in the flesh is that you're alien to this flesh. You, you are in disguise. Um, and I personally think that that's blasphemous because uh, that's an incarnation. That's what happened to Jesus. Jesus was God incarnate in flesh, the word become flesh. So mm. for me to say, I too was this angelic being who lived in, by, you know, within the, the realm of the throne room of God. And, and I came down and, and acquiesced to be put into a human body to suffer so that I can be a betterment for mankind. You are claiming to be God when you, when you claim that that is what's happened mm. to you. It, do you see the blasphemy masked in, in, in this, in this, doctrine yeah also what i see is is and this is very simplistic to what all you've been saying i see this this need they're, they're taking like you said very biblical things and they're counterfeiting them like like all the identity statements that like from ephesians and all this stuff that some of them that we are now and some of them that we were like you said we're gonna be and and they're they're they're, they're realizing that that es eschatological future now instead of it being something that we have one day in the new heaven and new earth or in heaven or wherever. And, and I, I you know, exactly. And, yeah. They're just counterfeiters. Exactly. You which, you, which is we now, Oh, go ahead, Randy. I was just going to say, you don't counterfeit something that's not valuable. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So I love the way you just put that because what we in essence have here with the children of God and the star seed is a cosmic version of the prodigal son. Mm. We, we've, we've got this brother who wants that inheritance now. And then we've got the brother who waits for it, but he's in his flesh. So he, <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's sort of disgusted with the brother that gets the inheritance. And, um, and it's, it's an even greater analogy because what a lot of people don't know, but in th this goes back into the Semitic culture, which is why it's so important to understand the context, the culture, the history, the language, and the geography of the text. If you're divorced from any of those five things, you're going to interpret the, the scriptures and the authors incorrectly. In Semitic culture, one of the reasons why the brother of the prodigal son was so disgusted was when half of the inheritance went to the, to the first son, what that meant was upon the father's death, the inheritance was still going to be split again 50-50. So it's not that at, upon death, the, the guy that did all the right things got his 50%. He ended up getting 25% of the 50% that was mm. left. So you that correlates with these people. Uh, the, the parable that Jesus told about the people that got paid the same wages who worked all day and who only worked a few hours of the day. And then the mm. people that, that got the same wages were bitter. Like, Hey, how come he got the same thing I did? And the same thing that everyone's getting is the salvation. I, I, I personally believe that people that spend their whole life killing their sin and mortifying their flesh and longing to see the face of Christ, 
there will be benefits beyond salvation for them in eternity. There will be depths mm-hmm. of the glory of Jesus Christ that they will experience that people who didn't value the glory of Jesus Christ won't see. You know, but by way of the actual gift of salvation, the wages are the same. And there there are Christians that do have bitterness that there's people out there having fun and partying and sleeping around and taking drugs and doing whatever they want. And how can they're getting away with it? And um, I, I see that playing out here in, mm-hmm. in this grouping of the star seed, as opposed to the, to the children of God seed where there is um, there, there is, it's, 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 a, it's a timing issue, isn't it? Mm-hmm. If we believe that we're going to get all of these things. We just have to wait a little bit longer for it. Whereas right. the star seed, it's like, uh, these are all the things that the spiritual realm is willing to offer humanity, but I want it now. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, you're right. I see it. So let me ask you this. Um, what, what, what kind yeah. of, I don't want to take you off course, but what, what kind of influence... No. Does this Council of Eight have in what's going on in the world today? And do they have their their tentacles in 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 events that are going on today? The elites and you know all the the they is what I call them. The whoever they is. Yeah, yeah, yep. Well, I think I like I don't know specifically, Brandon, but what what I think we can glean from is if they're mimicking something biblically, then my guess is what they have their hands in is the mere image of what the biblical council of eight is doing. And so if we can explore the biblical council of eight, maybe we can get an idea of, of what the council of eight is trying to mimic for their own gain. Okay. So, uh, in a nutshell, I'll, I'll just kind of like unwrap the present first and then we can kind of discuss, but uh, there is several verses. Um, I've got 18 of them here right in front of me. Uh, this is not an obscure concept or an obscure passage. And I don't know how familiar Christians are with, with this concept. We talk a lot about the Holy Spirit in the singular. But the scriptures talks about the seven spirits of God. And mm-hmm. it talks about it frequently. It's not just one verse that we've built a whole doctrine on. In fact, we haven't built a doctrine on it because hardly anybody talks about it. Right. Uh, these seven spirits of God, there's many references to them in Revelation. And uh, the, the seven spirits of God who stand before the throne of Jesus, of Yahweh, uh, that would be the eighth. That, so we've got the, the this, is the, this is what the menorah represents right the seven right. spirits of god right and the seven the seven spirits of god which are before the throne and then we have the menorah in the temple which uh, stands before the the ark of the covenant so um in the earthly temple and the heavenly temple this menorah is placed uh in the presence of of the throne and so these seven spirits of god along along with the, with the throne of god is the is the eight so that's the council of eight in the, in the heavens is the throne, mm-hmm. the throne of God, and then the seven spirits that sit before the throne. And I've heard all sorts of stuff, you guys, about everyone's got their idea of what these seven spirits are. And, right. you know, some people will cross-reference it with other passages and say, it's the spirit of wisdom and understanding and knowledge and power. And I, right. I've done some research on that, and I've looked, I've looked up the cross-references that they're aligning it with, and it, it doesn't seem to numerically always perfectly line up with me and um some people then say it's the seven graces of god and um that the seven spirits in it it all combined together is the holy spirit and uh the the explanation that i like the most is that it's tied into a very obscure verse in zechariah uh so zechariah 4:10, lots of prophetic um uh, scriptures in Zechariah. Zechariah 4.10 says, uh, For who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They, meaning the seven, 
they are the eyes of Jehovah roaming throughout the earth. Hmm. So we have got Jehovah roaming to and fro throughout the earth, seeking hearts that are fully committed to him. And it says, when the son of man returns on the earth, will he find faith? You know, he's, he's roving the earth and he has got these seven spirits, discerning spirits, eyes, the eyes are the lamp, um, seven lampstands. These are all images. And to put it in modern terms, like let's think of it in terms of it's not seven floating eyeballs, but, you know, let, let's think of something more creative, like, you know, <laughs> some sort of drone or, or he's got some sort of, you know, device. And I'm not saying that he has a physical device, but what I'm saying is what I'm trying to get away from is people getting some silly caricature in their mind of, you know, Jesus flying around with a red cape holding seven eyeballs and jars. Like, cause I think that when we, when we have silly analogies p- painted in our head, we tend to just throw those things away. Yeah. Yeah. But if these, if these seven spirits are like, I, I hate to use a occult metaphor, but what if they're like palantirs, you know, like in Lord of the Rings where the, these glass balls that, yeah. Like, uh, yeah. conjure up mm-hmm. um, information um, what if these are seven you know palantirs that can read the hearts and the souls and the minds and the action and the will and the emotions of mankind what if these are divining balls you know instead of divining mm-hmm. rods what if these are these are cosmic you know devices that are uh, you, you know, like the Terminator movie, the first Terminator movie, that scene where he, uh, you, you see the, the, the human beings from Schwarzenegger's perspective, and then you see the red eye, everything's red. It's like, and, and it's, it's showing all the information. Uh, that's the kind of hmm. eyes I'm thinking of. What if this is some sort of, um, highly sophisticated mind reading piece of technology where mm-hmm. Jehovah roves throughout the earth and these seven eyes are just bam, 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 bam. You know, in a second, he can tell you everything you've ever done, where you've been, what you're thinking, who you are. Uh, this, this is an instrument of, of judgment. And, and I don't mean judgment, like you're going to hell judgment. It it's, it's an, an instrument of him discerning yeah. who his children are. Yeah. So if you have a council of eight, you've got a fake Messiah with a fake panel of seven people surrounding him. And they are now acting as the judges of mankind. Mm. Now we're in a heap of trouble because now we've got people uh, channeling these things and talking all about love and peace and all this beautiful coming together and how we're going to open the eyes and awaken mankind to their destiny. But if the guy holding the reins who gets to define love and gets to define eternity and gets to divide, define peace and shalom is a guy who has completely bastardized, destructive, evil, narcissistic definitions to those words that he's not going to reveal to his children on, until, you know, the big vat of Kool-Aid gets rolled out and they all get to drink of it or they're all going to mm-hmm. wipe hail bop or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the, that's where my heart is for these people. Because right now, they are being filled with arcane knowledge, flattery, purpose, hope, uh in a lot of times followers that are saying you've helped me so much and I it's all this love and peace and joy but when the cannons roll out and the cannons start firing this is the thing that people don't understand about Satan I don't care how faithfully you've served him or how long you've served him or what you've sacrificed for him when those cannons roll out the first thing that before he even gets to the Christians 
he's going to roll those cannons around and and fire on his own people. Mm. And it's it's going to be the worst version of friendly fire you ever seen in your life. And so that that's what's so devastating to me about this uh, corruption of Jehovah on his throne with the seven spirits of God. The the seven spirits of God are roaming to and fro to find righteous people that he can save, that he he can bring into his presence, that he can give total healing, a resurrection body, and exponential joy that increases moment by moment for eternity, where we share in his in priestly duties. So what, I ask you, what are the seven spirits of this Council of Eight searching for? And what are they going to promise their seed that follows them? Because they're not going to have a throne or a kingdom to offer their people when, when the battle is done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I like that idea. Just going back to the seven spirits in Revelation. So, something never quite sat right with me of just saying, oh, that's just the Holy Spirit. I mean, we, we've got this three-in-one Trinitarian thing, and now you're dividing one of them into seven. <laughs> I was like, no, but why can't they be spirits or even what you're saying, more devices spiritual, almost? Spiritual technology is what I'd call it, you know? Spiritual technology. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that idea better. And man, yeah, you're right. Just It makes sense that the kingdom of darkness would want to counterfeit that with this council of eight. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's all right under our nose, but again, if we're divorced from the context, culture, language, history, geography of a text, Mm -hmm. we only have our modern pictures, you know, and uh, I just want to explain to people the picture of the heavenly throne that, that has been mirrored for us on earth. So in heaven, you've got the the throne, you've got God the Father at the right hand, you've got God the Son, and then you've got this menorah of the seven spirits sitting before the throne. And this is mirrored in the temple. Uh, and in the temple uh, of the Old Testament, you, you would go into the holy place that was separated by the veil from the most holy place. So behind the most holy place is the throne of God the Father. And then right outside of that, in the, in the holy place, to the left, you've got the menorah with the lights that were perpetually lit, that the high priest kept them perpetually lit. And then to the right, to the right hand, seated at the right hand of the Ark of the Covenant, was the table of showbread, the bread of life, the mm. Messiah. And so you have here mirrored a throne the bread of life to the right hand and the seven spirits as, as exemplified in this menorah to the left. This wasn't just temple decorations or church tradition or paraphernalia. They right. were showing mankind. This is the org chart of the throne room. This is the org chart. So the council of eight is mocking and mimicking that org chart in their own heaven, their their astral plane. And here here's the scary thing. For any human being who's never seen the real thing, the counterfeit is going to look incredibly convincing. And for those of us who know and have received Christ, we have been given a glimpse of the real thing in right. that it's been modeled for us in, in the temple. And so if you've got a uh, a throne room set up that doesn't match that biblical model, it's going to be a tip off for you. I'm in the wrong heaven here, mm-hmm. and and so, but but that means that you have to understand the dynamic of of the real heavens. And so, when we got a guy in a white beard sitting on a golden chair, and Jesus sitting next to him, and we have no idea. We just kind of, that seven spirits of God is almost like a throwaway verse. And because no one understands it, or everybody in their attempt to to make sense of it, just start throwing darts at the wall and hoping it will stick. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, And if you don't understand that the symbol, you know, the, 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 the symbol of the nation of Israel is the menorah. And I know that their flag has the star of David on it, but I'll, I will tell you all something. I was in Israel in 94, I think. And our tour guide was a uh, Holocaust survivor. And so a lot of people on the bus were asking him questions about the statehood, the statehood of Israel and what a glorious day that was. And so everyone was asking questions about, you know, when all those laws passed. And so Izzy, our, our tour guide, said that the people of Israel were told that they were going to get to vote and choose on the flag, what the, what the flag would look, look like. And they unanimously voted that the symbol that should go on the state flag of Israel would be the menorah because it is and always has been the symbol of their mm-hmm. nation. And mm-hmm. they were, they were, their vote was overridden and the star of David was put on instead. And I could go, I could do a whole nother show on that. But, uh, the fact of the matter is it's more than a candlestick. There's something more to this. It's not just some, uh, decoration for the synagogue that this menorah is representative of something crucial to the understanding of of the kingdom that we are one day going to be a part of and so with something as crucial as the menorah you know that the enemy is going to mimic it and so it's it's interesting to me that this doctrine of the council of eight is about as obscure as the doctrine of the seven spirits of God, if you're inside of the church. And so whenever there is something that is overlooked or hidden or won't be declassified, so to speak, there's Mm -hmm. something crucial there. And I think that the church needs to take a second look at the 18 verses that explicitly talk about the seven spirits of God. And we got to stop turning it into some sort of Tony Robbins, like, you know, rah, rah business conference, like God wants to give you the spirit of knowledge and wisdom and power. So again, that's man centered. <laughs> mm-hmm. mm-hmm. um, if there are seven spirits before the throne of God in heaven, that means that there are seven beings that have spent their entire existence gazing on the glory of God, something that we will die instantly if we look upon. And I just think we need a better explanation for what these seven spirits are. And in understanding then who they are, we have to, we have to use it as, as a weapon to expose and unmask the, the imitators and the counterfeits. You know, it's interesting that the Council of Eight member was saying to the human beings at that convention in Texas, you know, you're not human. You're in disguise. You're in a mask. Mm. They're, they're the ones in a mask. That's the irony. That's yeah. the irony. They're the ones coming to, to mankind wearing a mask disguised as an angel of light, mm. but it's the beast himself. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Is there somewhere we could get those, what did you say, 18 verses? Yes. Yep. Um, I've got them here. I can send them to you and you can put them in liner notes or whatever. Yeah, please. Cool. And I'm just going to read a couple of them just so the, the listeners get uh, a feel for just the power that what would like the, ver- the the word is a double edged sword. And I just pray that this brings um, conviction to those who haven't heard it and just worship to those who, who, who claim to be a gun. Yes. Revelation 1 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. So this is amazing. John is writing a letter to the seven churches in Asia. He's giving them a greeting, grace and peace from him who sits on the throne, God the Father. And from him who was and who is to come, the Messiah at the right hand. And from the Holy Spirit? No. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. So these seven spirits are actually through the 
the writings of John delivering a message to mankind, grace to you and peace. This is the heavenly council of eight uh, Mm. under the commandership of, of, of the God of the universe, sending humanity greetings of grace and peace. So this is what the council of eight is, uh, is attempting to mimic. They are mimicking revelation one, four. They're coming with a mask on bright lights and, and, and filling people. And, and what are they saying? Grace to you and peace from the council of eight. Uh, but we know from the scriptures that that message was delivered from a different council of eight centuries before, before eight, 1983, when this first guy decided to come and, and make himself known, this first ascended master. So all they can do is, you know, what, what does the enemy do? He kills, he steals, and he destroys. He mm. is stealing. This council of eight is stealing uh, because they are just plagiarizing everything that is in the scriptures. Uh, Vicki, let, let me ask you a question, if you don't mind. Have you studied the Old Testament context of the seven spirits at all and, and what the Jews thought about those seven spirits or anything like through Talmudic or Midrash uh, stuff or any of that kind of stuff? Not yet. My my research in this is so fresh um, to the point where it was sort of foolish for me to even suggest that we do this show today. And uh, the reason why this uh, topic has become so close to my heart is because, as I mentioned at the at the front of the show, in the last year, I've I've been doing so many podcasts for for my They Only Come Out at Night book, and yeah. I have been interviewed and been on the shows of several people who do channel the Council of Eight. And these were, these were lovely, wonderful people who were kind and gracious and their heart is in the right place. Yeah. Everything about what they're doing, they, they a hundred percent have their motives that they, they really believe that they're helping. And, and so my heart goes out to them and it's my desire to reach people in the new age that, that I really wanted to start studying this. So my, my first old Testament, uh, run in with the seven spirits was that Zechariah 410 verse that I wrote right. uh, that I read earlier. Yeah. And I'm so fascinated now with the correlation between Zechariah and Revelation that I think my next on the agenda is to start really diving into Zechariah. Hmm. Well what what do you think about the uh the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins and they're getting a bowl for their lamps. Do you think that could be uh did you, is that one of the Mark or Luke or Matthew scriptures? Lindsay, you're my scholar. Where Where is that the foolish <laughs> virgin? In the well, I didn't even get all the verses she gave. Oh, I, man, I was right. right. <laughs> I was kind of trying to type one. But Go ahead. one that I found interesting I, was um, this idea, the, the verse. I just had it. And then I went to something else. In uh, Luke 11, I believe, just about Jesus talking about when the when a demon finds the house swept clean, he goes and gets seven more. I thought that was mm. so. Yeah, seven plus that one makes eight. I, is that where you're going with that verse, or I think that was Luke eleven. Yeah, that is the Luke eleven one. Yeah, that that is amazing. That the parallel between between that and just think about it too. You don't just wake up one day and say, I want to channel the Council of Eight and channel them. You right. have mm-hmm. taken many, many, many foundational steps to reach steps. the point where they're going to, yeah. they're going to contact you. Mm-hmm. And so there are potentially hundreds of doors you have already opened in conjuring and communicating with these things, whether it's a Ouija board, meditation, astral projection. And it's interesting to me that, uh, <sighs> If at any point, because a lot of these people that are into this stuff, they they will talk about how um, once they've opened those doors, the paranormal activity starts or the sleep paralysis starts, and they mm-hmm. want to get rid of that stuff. They want to get rid of the side effects, but they don't really want to get rid of the power that they're that they're um, obtaining. And so, mm-hmm. there are a lot of people that will come 
that are, are steeped in this stuff and they want deliverance. But what they really want deliverance from is the consequences and the side effects, not the actual activity. And so what's happening and what, what I find interesting about this verse in Luke 11 is if you are one of these people that you want deliverance from the consequences, but you really, you're going to keep communicating with these things, it's going to go and find seven more. And mm. that's fascinating to me because some of the people that get really, really steeped into this, they do come back with seven more and they've got a cute little name for themselves, you know, council of eight. So mm -hmm. it, it's fascinating to me. Some of these correlations, I am anxious to delve even, even deeper into this. I, I've just got some surface knowledge now, but I have a hunch that if godly people who love the word of God and love truth and love a study of the word, they like doing those deep dives, people that follow Gary Wayne and Derek Gilbert and Michael Heiser, and um, I know I'm missing many, but um, th those types of people, I think that if we are able to get our heads together and really unravel the the, the seven spirits of God and the correlation to the council of eight. And we could get, uh, you know, Dr. Judd Burton level materials out there to the church to educate the church. Mm -hmm. I think we could blow this new age doctrine wide open and we could probably save a lot of people yeah. from heartache and destruction. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Are, uh, are, are you, welcome i mean openly received into a lot of these podcasts and stuff i mean the one that i watched it was like she was so excited to interview you and she was so friendly and awesome and and all that are you are you welcome with open arms into these these groups yeah this this is crazy I, i'm glad you brought this up when when i first went on this journey and you know got the publicist and i uh, we had this little interview and i was like okay you know i thought I did a good job of explaining who I was and what my worldview was. Right. And all of the invites started coming in and they were new age, like hardcore new age. And I, I admit <laughs> human fear took over. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Hey, that's okay. I refuse to believe that David's heart wasn't pounding out of his chest as he was running towards Goliath. You know, it's okay to, yep. to have that fear. I love what Jamie Walden says in his book, his book, Omega Dynamics. There, uh, there is no courage without fear. Hmm. It, how, how, how do you develop courage if there's no fear? And so, um, I, I was afraid. I, I thought these people are going to shut me down. They're going to change the subject. They're going to not air my show. They're going to be offended. I'm going to trigger them. You know, all these things that we're told in, right. in mainstream media that, you know, we're, we're being told right. that what we believe is offensive. And a lot of Christians believe that what we believe is so offensive that they're going to get in trouble or thrown in prison or beat up if they, if they speak the truth. But here, here's what's happened to me. Human beings are so ravenously starving for truth because we, mm. we don't get it anywhere anymore. It, it's hard to find in the churches. It's hard to find on television. We, we are dehydrated of truth. And the body knows. When the, when the body's dehydrated, it knows when it's getting water and it knows when it's getting urine, right? And so mm -hmm. if, if you're in the desert and, and you're about to die if you don't get some water, you're going to understand, your body is going to understand, your brain and uh, all the organs in your body. You might not know the difference as someone who's parched, but your body is going to understand the difference between fresh water and a mud puddle, okay? So what I find interesting is when I'm on these shows, they are not just kind and gracious to me they're not just really good objective hosts who have you know are so skilled in journalism that they can remain objective they they are those things but my take on it is that human beings are so bereft of truth that when mm. they hear it even if it goes against everything they believe it's like getting that glass of water in the desert right before you're about to keel over. Wow. And many of these people, uh, they, they've had me back two, three times. Uh, many of them are in touch with me now privately and we, we chat and, or they're DMing me on Instagram. And, uh, it, it's not me or my message or my book. It's that Jesus 
designed us. You know, we are designed in the image of God and we are, we do have an identity crisis. And when we brush up next to, uh, when we brush up next to Jesus, we feel at home, we feel something. And so surprisingly, uh, to me, one of the greatest joys of this journey for me has been, I have been able to not just talk about sleep paralysis, but I've been able to uh, use sleep paralysis as a springboard to lay out the gospel message of Jesus Christ on shows that would otherwise never give me the time of day. And the message is being received. Now, I don't know that the gospel is being received, but they're listening to the message and it's not just the hosts. Uh, I don't do a lot of reading of comments, uh, but I always expect to go into these comment sections on some of these and have people go, oh, like she's a Jesus freak or, oh, they had to bring the stupid Bible into it. Like I'm expecting just, you know, the, the trolls to, to be coming out in, in, you know, droves. And the, the comment section is eat. The, the people are receiving it. Now, um, it's not like they're running to church the next day and praying to receive Jesus, but the way I look at it is, you know, you're handing them a jug of water and they are guzzling it down mm. for, for life and limb. And so it's been really exciting um, getting my, getting an opportunity to preach the gospel to people who would otherwise probably never be looking for it or stumble into a place where they think they would be exposed to it. And uh, my, my delight right now, uh, you know, talking about sleep paralysis and selling books is secondary to the joy that I get in getting to uh, have a forum to explain the gospel message to people who may have never otherwise heard it explained correctly. Yeah, it's sad. I, um... I'm not saying this to be ugly or mean to, to these people, but you, you're, they're probably more receptive than a lot of your brothers and sisters in Christ are to a lot of this stuff. And yep, yep, you, yep. I'm willing to bet you get some mean, ugly comments from brothers and sisters in Christ about this. Yep. yep. I, I've only gotten a few. I've most of the snark that I've gotten has been from from believers mm. and this this is my this is what i this is what i say to people we are called as believers to be good Bereans. we are like paul paul knew what he was talking about right all of the stuff he wrote was inspired by the holy spirit and yet the Bereans still went home and double checked his work yeah. so that's cool if anybody uh, believe me it what's it say in the book of james not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. I'm going to be judged with greater strictness for having a platform. And so I am more than happy to know that people are looking at me sideways and going home and like, I'm going to check that in the Bible because I don't want to be responsible for people going down a, a bad path because I said something stupid one day. And, and I, I really don't have any sort of, uh, bad feelings towards towards the snark and you know i always tell people i i was bullied really bad as a kid i got oh man i got teased every day at school was a war zone for me mm -hmm. so at this point if someone has a snarky little comment in youtube it's like yawn <laughs> <laughs> i love it i love it yep that's great i had i had 18 years of boot camp for that buddy oh man yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, and, and kids are worse than adults too. So, you know, <laughs> as far as being oh ugly, gosh, yeah. yeah, but, uh, yeah, I, I was going to second what, what Lindsay said in, in, in most of, most of my, the snarky stuff comes from believers. And, and I just, I, I think that's sad. Yeah. I, I'm like you, I do. I read that this morning. Matter of fact, in the book of Acts about, the they, they were more noble than the, the uh, uh, Thessalonica and, and, you know, they, the Bereans and, and that's interesting you brought that up. And and I'm I want to be that too. I want to be founded on the word. But it's like it 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 actually encourages me and and uh I don't know what, what word I'm looking for. It um uplifts me that these people that that we're reaching out to already have a lot of the the gentleness and tenderness and all that kind of stuff down. And when they come in the body of Christ, they're gonna be awesome for the Lord. They're not going to have that religious spirit, so to speak, to to to, uh, and they'll they'll go after their 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 brethren, you know, in love, 
you know? Yep. Absolutely. I am in full agreement with that. Not to mention the fact they're going to have another thing that a lot of modern Christians don't have. They're going to have a fear and a respect for spiritual warfare. They're going to understand and believe the supernatural. Uh, It will not be truncated. They're going to come to them and and say, hey, pastor. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you're going to be able to go to them and say like, hey, I'm having this sleep paralysis and you're not going to get gaslit and you're not going to get interrogated (laughs) for to admit every sin you've ever committed. And so I, I absolutely agree with you on that. I think that people coming out of the new age and the occult are <laughs> prime to to be preaching the gospel because they understand that this is a, a war. And I don't know, well, I do know why a, a lot of the metaphors that are often quoted in churches are all the, all the life is a bowl of cherry kind of stuff. You know, God is love and it's light and there's peace. We hear about that. But if you break down the Bible and you pull out all the military metaphors, yes, uh, th- this is a this is a military book. This is this is a handbook, and I mean even the even the phrase "Great Commission" that's a military mm-hmm. term, and yes. and so um, at, at least the people that are redeemed out of the occult in the New Age, they're going to read the Bible and believe things without having to. Um, dumb it down for for the the, the the gasping masses of pew warmers, you know, like they, they can take a verse at face value is what I'm saying. Well, I was listening to a popular apologist. I'm not going to name him just the other day that I love. I have several of his books. I respect him. Brilliant man. And he basically, I heard him say Genesis is not really about literal history. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I mean, he's evangelical and Ooh. believes... And in, in, in the in, you know in the inerrant word and all that stuff, but he's just he's he's he, he's so rational. We're, we're, Christians are trapped in this rationalism that those new age folks are not trapped in. You know that's why I, I love Native American type. Uh, I always had a heart for Native American type spirituality. I've always told Lindsay that when they get saved, they 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 already have something that we don't have as Westerners. They have um, if they're still in that culture, basically if they hadn't been Americanized. If they're still in that culture, they have that aspect of the supernatural is there and they will they'll do Mark sixteen, sixteen. They'll heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, do you know, they will do what the Bible says. And you give them a Bible without all of our Western teachings and they're gonna read it and they're gonna say, Okay, well, how do I do this stuff? You know, where's it at? You know, give me somebody <laughs> to administer to, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And so Absolutely. I'm, exci- and I'm they're, excited. I'm excited for that. They're also going to, yeah, me too. And the Native Americans are also going to believe that Genesis six is about giants. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, they all know what's buried in those mounds. They <laughs> do. Like yeah, modern seminaries. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah or the Smithsonian do. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. They know what's <laughs> they know what's buried in there. Uh, it, yep. So, well, uh, look, this is. This has been awesome. I mean, I, I'm so excited that you did this with us, and and this is um, fascinating. I, I'm going to do some research on my own on all this, and and I, I think I'm going to dive into some of the Old Testament kind of stuff. And anything I'll get, I'll I'll mm-hmm. funnel to you or whatever. But uh, we're both research bugs. We're both, like you said, yeah, uh, word, word nerds, I guess, or whatever. But but uh, uh, oh yeah, yeah. we. We love this kind of stuff. So, now, Vicky, if they want to get get a hold of you, and if they want to find out where your stuff is, where social media they can connect with you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, you can find me at vickyjoyanderson.com. That's Vicky with an I. Anderson is S O N. And uh, you can there's links on there to all of my books. But if you want, they only come out at night exposing the dark weapon of sleep paralysis. That book is available exclusively on lamarzuli.net. You can also find me three or four nights a week on Through the Black 2 on YouTube. Me and Tom Dunn um, do a bunch of shows. And in fact, we do a show Thursday nights called Audiotopsy with our friend Kenny C, where we do presuppositional analysis on song lyrics. Uh, you can find my articles on realdarknews.com and you can find me on Instagram at Vicky Joy Author. 
Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm not going to mm-hmm. hold you to this by any shape, form, or fashion, but I'd love to have you on one of our movie nights. <laughs> you just think about that and pray about that. Ooh. We'll get with you about that. So, yeah, we just did Crossroads last night. So That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, Brandon told me just what you got from the, the Dark City, just from a little bit of viewing. And I was like, wow, yeah, she would be good to. To have yeah, on that sometime. That movie, that was crazy. Yeah, yeah. it was crazy movie. It, Came out before the Matrix. <laughs> yeah. Really. Yeah. 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 Wow. Like a year or so before, the world wasn't ready for that kind of movie just yet. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that thing just had so much symbolism in it. I couldn't even believe it. All the spirals and mm-hmm. so I don't know if I told you guys this, but like you know the the spirals. Derek Gilbert told me that there is a plaque in England somewhere that they pulled off of Mount Hermon. And mm. it was a plaque commemorating the spot where the watchers came down. And it literally said, like, this marks the spot where the 200 watchers, well, whatever, something to that effect. And the symbols on that plaque are those spirals. It's mm. an ancient watchers symbol. Oh, so. Wow. That was all over Dark City. And, you know, when they panned out and showed, like, the whole, like, Flat Earth universe, and it, it, it had that cloud that was like a spiral over the whole thing. And it's like, mm-hmm. oh, my gosh. Well, everywhere. It, the other yeah. interesting thing, yeah. it, it, isn't pedophilia symbolized with a triangle with a, a, a swirl in it? Yes. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they there's several pedophilia symbols that are spirals in different shapes. Yeah. Yeah, and I always thought I thought of the circumpunk too when I saw that spiral as well. Um, I know mm, it's not it's mm. not properly a you know it doesn't have the dot in the middle and but but I thought about that too. Mm-hmm. So yeah, but I appreciate you so much for coming on the show and uh, dropping your your amazing knowledge here. Yes, thanks, Vicky. Yeah, absolutely. And, Thank uh, you guys so much for having me on. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening and supporting us. And remember, stay naturally supernatural.